All right, time for your exciting mailbag questions answered 100% correctly, and this is Key or Your Money Back. We've got it, uh, I guess, questions on the Bucks, the Rays, so let's get started. All right, Rob had just tweeted us. He says, hey, guys, I've heard some noise about the Bucks potentially trading Chris Godwin. Does this really make sense? At his salary, what could they get in return? By the way, great show. Of all the things he said, the last, the last two words of that were probably the most important. Um, trading Chris Godwin, uh, I don't necessarily see that in, in the sense that he is in the last year of his contract. So, you know, you did that with Carlton Davis, right? But Carlton Davis was a player that was often injured. And I thought you got back some pretty good value, um, giving up Carlton and two six round picks for a third rounder this year with Chris. I mean, look, do I think that they're going to sign him to a new deal next year? I, I don't know. I don't think so. I would say it's probably trending the other way. You know, Chris has had a significant knee injury. It's clearly affected him. You know, production-wise, he's still hung in there. Where it's got him a little bit in the, is in the red zone. Last year, they moved him outside thinking that that would sort of help preserve him. But, you know, he doesn't have sort of that start and stop uh, and then explosive movement there that you need to play on the outside. So they're going to move him back to the slot. And I think a lot of it will have to do, you know, with the draft. Now, as far as trading him goes, you know, when's the best time to trade a player? Um, probably before the draft, sometimes after, if teams don't get what they're looking for. And then, of course, the trade deadline has been sometime in October. And I think they're talking about moving that back. So, you know, you'd have to see where the team is at. But to think that on on a team that doesn't have receivers, right? I mean, Mike Evans is 31, and we don't think he's going to play that many more seasons. He's signed for two more years. But at this level, it would be hard to imagine he could maintain that. Uh, Regardless, they're going to have to try to, you know, restock the position. And I think that means this year, and I think it means in the draft, and it could mean with their first-round pick, just depending on who's there. Um, You know, if you remember, Mike Evans was drafted in, what, 2014, I think? Mm -hmm. And he was was able to come aboard when Vincent Jackson was his age, 31 years old. And he had a year or two with Vincent mentoring him. So that's kind of the best case scenario. Now, Mike was an elite physical talent coming out of A&M. He hadn't played a lot of football, really. Um, But he, you could see, you know, his ability to, to run and and high point balls and do all those things. And he had to work hard to become a good pro. But I think the time to, to, to start looking at that position is now because both your guys are, are getting up there in age. And in terms of Chris, I think there's, you know, his biological age, and then there's his football age. And I'm not sure that his football age, you know, doesn't exceed Mike's. So from that standpoint, if they really wanted to trade Chris, I think they probably would have done it. But then you got to ask yourself this, what's the market for Chris Godwin? In other words, who's giving you real value, right, for him? Is he more valuable to you than what you could get back in return? You know, is that a third round pick? Is it a fourth rounder? Um, I'm not sure. And so, you know, you just look at their receiving core. You know, Trey Palmer is a guy that they have hopes for, but he's a sixth round pick. You know, if your sixth rounder becomes a number two receiver someday, you're thrilled. He's got speed. Um, you know, he's got a lot, a long way to go in terms of understanding the game and route running and 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 you know making catches and those kinds of things. But I don't see, you know, with Devin Tompkins, I, I don't see that next generation of, you know, number one and number wide receiver one and wide receiver two. And so the time to sort of address a position and what is a very good receiver draft is deep, maybe even with the first overall pick or their their first overall pick, um, not overall in the draft, but you know what I mean, first round pick, would be this year. And I kind of think that's the direction they're leaning. And maybe they draft more than one, you know. But to me, the next trade window for Chris would be 
once you kind of know how the season is going, if for some reason there was a contending team that just felt they were one Chris guy went away from going to the Super Bowl, maybe you you consider it then. But I have not heard that. I, I think, you know, in talking, um, you know, to the Bucks, to Liam Cohen, he's excited about what he can do with him. He's going to run a lot of three receiver sets. You know, Liam Cohen, it, 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 unlike, you know, what, what they had, um, he, he doesn't run as many two tight end personnel. He's more one tight end and three wide receivers. So just in terms of numbers, you know, he'd like to have three quality guys to run out there on most downs. And, you know, to me, that's Chris, Mike, and then somebody, right? Um, so, yeah, I, I don't see it. Anything's possible, but I, I haven't heard that, and I don't see it happening. Well, speaking of wide receivers, I don't know if you saw the pro football focus list. They put out a list of the best wide receivers since 2010. I will list them for you. Antonio Brown, Calvin Johnson, Julio Jones, Tyreek Hill, Justin Jefferson, Devontae Adams, DeAndre Hopkins, other. Notice anyone missing? Was the last one Hopkins that you named? Correct. Okay. And so that's seven, right? That's seven. Okay. So they didn't list 10, but they said seven. Mm -hmm. Best wide receiver since 2010. Okay. Notice anybody missing? Well, you know, what we call around here the GOAT. I mean, you know, I mean, what we call the GOAT. I mean, Mike Evans, you know, is that guy, and all he's done is set a piece of NFL history. By the way, I'm not sure all those other guys have, but I know Mike has a niche. And I think that it's hard to to be sitting, you know, most of the guys they named – just in that list, I think are going to be Hall of Famers, right? Mm-hmm. Antonio Brown is a Hall of Fame receiver. Calvin Johnson's a Hall of Fame receiver. Julio Jones is a Hall of Fame receiver. Tyreek Hill is certainly on that arc. Um, Justin Jefferson, while young, on that arc. The guy I would maybe disagree with ahead of Mike is Devontae Adams. And I know, look, Devontae Adams has gotten a lot of run throughout his career. Okay. And rightfully so. He's an outstanding receiver. But, you know, the first, I don't know, eight years of his career, he played with Aaron Rodgers. You know, and that was his quarterback every single year. Um, and then then he went to the Raiders, and he played one year with Derek Carr, you know, which didn't go so well. But that was his quarterback from Fresno. Um, I would say this. Let's look at Devontae Adams' numbers. And Mike Evans. Mike Evans has him now both in yards, career yards, and touchdowns, I believe. At one point, there was a difference of one touchdown. But then Mike, to talk about good company, he just tied Tyree Kill for the most touchdowns in the NFL a year ago. Um, you know, so when you're still leading the league, you know, and you're 31 years old, mm-hmm. Devontae Adams didn't do that, by the way. And, and I would also say, you know, Let's talk about Super Bowls. Let's talk about, you know, what quarterbacks you played with. I mean, these are discussions that they have at the Hall of Fame. I've been in that room before. And I think it matters if you're a receiver and you played with, you know, Dan Marino your entire career, right? Um, That's a big deal. Devontae Adams is going to have that that same discussion. And I think he may be a Hall of Famer, but I know Mike is, okay? Okay. And I know what Mike played with. I mean, you're talking about Josh McCown, you know, Mike Glennon. And yes, it wasn't all rosy with Jameis Winston. That was five years of his career, probably the best five years in terms of his physical abilities. Although I think he's become, you know, better at, at his body and stuff like that. But we know that Jameis Winston was a turnover machine. You know, he threw a lot of interceptions. Now, they targeted him a lot, um, and that's good. But it, it, it's not it's not playing with Aaron, with Aaron Rodgers every week, you know, for the first eight years of your career. So, you know, some of these other guys were drafted. You know, two thousand ten was was the uh, the cutoff point. But what I see there are guys like Julio Jones and, and Calvin Johnson. And I question the Justin Jefferson one, and not. 
his well, ability think, and where he'll end up. Upside, but, yeah, but after upside. four years, like. But since 2010, you can't say that because he hasn't played enough. That's what I'm saying. I mean, yeah. I'm not saying he won't be on that list, but yeah. to put him on a list like that after only four seasons. Yeah, that's very presumptuous. I mean, he I, I, look, I'm not taking away from his ability, and, and I think he w- he absolutely can be a Hall of Famer and can be up there. Mm-hmm. But to put him ahead of Mike Evans when you're talking about a since 2010 list. Well, and let's see, too, with him, you know, last year Kirk Cousins got hurt. Mm-hmm. Is Justin Jefferson going to have the number of targets? Is he going to have a, a quarterback that isn't a rookie that's quality enough to to maximize his potential? Yeah, we'll I mean see. it's a hell of a guess, you know. And he was hurt some last year too. He, he missed was hurt like yeah. seven games, and that's also part of it, right? Mm-hmm. Like, let's see if he can play more than four years. I agree with you. Yeah, that's a great point. I think, I think, while I I can see the greatness in him, absolutely. But you you got to you got to put in more work, homie. You know, like you, you really need to um, to be here more than four years because you know four years of any player does not a Hall of Famer make, and especially when you're going back to 2010. You know, I'm sure if we really spent the time, and I'm not going to here, but um, we could probably come up with some other receivers that should deserve to be on that list. But I know Mike does. I mean, it's, it's and I don't. You know, what's funny is that every time Mike Evans plays a national TV game uh, or, or they're in the playoffs uh, and he makes these, you know, circus catches like he did at Detroit. And he, he dropped some balls too last year. Don't, don't misunderstand me. But anytime he's exposed, like he was the Super Bowl year, everybody always comes back and says, wow, Mike Evans, maybe the most underrated player at his position, an underrated receiver. How come you don't hear about him with blank, blank, blank? But if you keep saying that, now he's no longer underrated. You've just rated him as one of the best. And so I don't know why they consistently like to, you know, and it's true in terms of like Pro Bowls and things, although he's now he's, I think he's been to like five. Um, you know, they like to see you when you're going to the Hall of Fame make, you know, all decade teams and things like that. That won't happen with Mike because he started at a time when the Bucks didn't win, you know, for for seven years, uh, and so I I just don't understand why he's consistently overlooked, even by those who say he's consistently overlooked. If that makes sense, is it just it's time, and especially the the very parallel that Mike's agent liked to use is is Devontae Adams because it came out in the same draft, you know. And you know, at, at the start of last season, Mike had more yards and Devontae had one more touchdown. At the end of the season, Mike has more yards and Devontae has less touchdowns. So that's a uh, – and you know, these things are in the eye of the beholder. But again, you know, add it to the list of slights. Now, maybe they, if they played it out, he would be 10 or 9 or 8. I don't know. Um, but he, he deserves to be on this list. And I like your point that Justin Jefferson, we don't know. You can't, it, it's really hard to compare a Justin Jeff. Everybody on this list is going to the hall of fame. I'm almost certain, but I don't know that Justin Jefferson is because I don't know how many years he's going to play. You're not going to go if you play five or six years, there's just no way. So that's, that's a little premature, but it's interesting, man. I, you know, I think Mike is very capable of getting another thousand this year and another thousand the next year, and then we'll see if he wants to play. Especially if Baker is still their quarterback, Baker is going to get him the ball. You know, Liam Liam Cohen is going to get him the ball, and he's going to make his plays. And a thousand yards with a seventeen game season is, isn't what it used to be, but it does show the consistency that this guy has had. And I, I just, it's stunning to me that that uh, people continue to do that. I think a lot of it has to do, frankly. You know, look what happened to the talent down here, which had been here, the Levante Davids and the Mike Evans and and people like that, when Tom Brady showed up. Now, all of a sudden, they were a great discovery. Now, it's like, wow, those guys are really good. Wow, that defense is really humming. You know, wow, you know, uh, Shaq Barrett and Vita Vea and, you know, everyone was discovered, right? Because winning is what people love. They love winners. And, you know, but Tom Brady – Bright brought that bright spotlight to the Bucks and to Mike Evans. And then all of a sudden it was like, you know, they're going to Pro Bowls every year and 
Uh, they won a Super Bowl. And so that was great for all their careers, but apparently not great enough. So we'll see. I mean, look, I, I'm, I'm pretty certain that when you're the only one to do something at your position in the NFL that's been around for over 100 years, you deserve to go to the Hall of Fame. And, and I'm almost, I would like to make that argument. I can't imagine, is he first ballot? I, I don't get into that because, you know, there's, there's so many politics about who's a first ballot Hall of Famer or who's a, who has to wait seven You know, Ronnie Barber waited seven years. Um, who retires with you. Yeah, exactly. Like, yeah, that class, there's too many first ballots. It's it's Peyton Manning. It's so-and-so uh, that have to go in. And there's only five spots, unlike baseball, who could have zero or they could have more. Uh, in, in the NFL, there's only five modern-day players. So that that's restricted in and of itself, depending on who retires and when. But I, I have no doubt that Mike's going to be a Pro Football Hall of Famer. We can't say that yet about Justin Jefferson, although it's trending that way. He's got, But look, football – and everybody knows this. You're one play away, and not even in in practice. It could be practice. You know, it, it is a lot of things that can knock you out of this league. It can be off the field stuff. You just don't know, you know, w- what's going to happen. So, um, that's that's a pretty bad oversight. Patrick sent a tweet. He says, "Love the show, gentlemen. Big fan of the Tampa Bay Times as well." Baker Mayfield was big news in free agency. Will we see an uptick in national exposure slash nationally televised games with him and Mike Evans running it back in 2024? Well, we haven't seen the national TV schedule yes, but I, uh, yet, but I think the, the easy answer to that is yes. And that is because a year ago, I want to say they had one Monday night game, I believe, and, and one Thursday, Thursday night. night game. Mm-hmm. And so, like, just if you think about it, they were a team not expected to do anything. Like people thought we saw SI, you know, two and two and fifteen and Peter King and all this stuff. Um when you make the playoffs, okay, you're one of twelve. Right? Those twelve teams are winning football teams, unless they've lost a, you know, legendary quarterback like the Patriots or something like that. Even then there's a kind of a year grace period. But you're one of twelve, okay? When you win a playoff game, right, you're on to the second round. Well, now there's only six teams that did that. So I, I'm pretty sure that that Baker, having re-signed, still with Mike Evans, Levante David back, Todd Bowles, the defensive mind that he is, some key pickups in the offseason like Jordan Whitehead, I, I'm pretty sure that they're going to be wanted by the networks, you know, whether that's certainly everybody will get a Thursday night, but I, I would expect there'd be more than two. I would say they double that. You know, I, and listen, I, nobody enjoys the one o'clock games more than me. Cause one, I don't sit out in the sun Two, my night's over at about seven 30 until I do the podcast with you. So I'd have no problem with them just overlooking them all together. <laughs> um, but I also don't see that happening, you know, and consider this, even if they're not the team that everybody wants to see, they play a first place schedule. They play at the Chiefs. They they play the Baltimore Ravens. The 49ers come here, right? Like those games are the ones that people are going to want to see around the country. And many of their opponents are first place teams because they finish first in their division. You know, Detroit. If that was a great game in the postseason. Why wouldn't it be a great game in the regular season? You know, so will, will the Bucks get a Wednesday Christmas Day? Game? Oh my God! Why would you even bring that up? Seriously, seriously, Steve. Why don't you just say, "Will they get one on the road?" That's the only thing that could be worse than that. I can't imagine. And and really, Wednesday, Wednesday. Yeah, the NFL's putting two games there this year. Supposedly. They want to own Christmas. They want to take it from the NBA. You know. I don't know what the saying is that pigs eat and hogs get slaughtered. Pigs or the other get way fat, around. hogs get slaughtered. That's it. Okay. Well, many years ago, I had this conversation, and I'm talking 15 years ago. I had this conversation with Rich McKay, who's this pretty smart guy, right? Chairman of the competition committee, longtime president of the Atlanta Falcons, been in personnel, been a GM. And you know what Rich told me? That what he feared and others in the NFL, and apparently not Roger Goodell, don't make him among those lists. What he feared was that the NFL 
is going to overexpose itself. And that, what I mean by that is they're already asking the fans of their league to commit to Sunday pretty much all day, right? If you're a viewer, and, and we're talking about television mostly. It's nice to have people in the stands and the owners make money with that. Don't don't get it wrong. But the general, you know, financing of the league is through TV. So, you know, if you're already committing, asking them to commit to money Sunday all day, Sunday night, okay, before they go to bed and get up to work Monday morning, Monday night, and then Thursday night, right, they always would say Fridays are sacred because you know, that's high school football. And we don't want, you know, our fans to choose, nor do we think they would choose. If they're going to go see their son play, they're not going to sit here and watch a game, you know, on, on Friday night. Actually, do you know why there's no football on Fridays? Go Tell me. I, I learned this this year because the NFL opening weekend is playing a Friday game in Brazil. It is a law from 1961 that the second Friday in September through November, you were not allowed to play NFL games on Friday. It's a law? Yes. Passed by Congress? Yes. Really? Yes. And it's actually, so the the Black Friday game, so it actually says 80% of the games on a Friday have to be done by 6 p.m., which is why the Black Friday game was played at 3 p.m., not in the evening last year. Interesting. It is actually a law in Congress. Man, you are bringing all kinds of knowledge to this podcast. That's why people love it so much. Yes. I had no idea. It's not the NFL saying we love high school football. Well, for it's once. Legally, they can't do it. But For once, but Congress the, got but something this year, right. Based on where Labor Day lands, the first weekend of the season is actually the first Friday of September, so it's not covered by the law, which uh, is why okay. they can play the Brazil game on that Friday. Does it matter that it's in Brazil? No. Okay. It's actually, well, that's a, I, I learned that this year with when the NFL announced the Brazil game is a Friday. It's fascinating to me. But all I know is, is that, you know, for years and years, the NBA and uh, may God rest their souls, they owned Christmas, right? That was their mm-hmm. deal. Um, and now the NFL wants it, you know, period. Uh, it's like the old line from concussion, you know, Sunday used to belong to God. Now it belongs to the NFL. Uh, so, you know, Christmas is on a different day every year. And when Roger Goodell was asked about playing two games, not one, but two games on Christmas and it being a Wednesday, which they typically never play except for maybe the COVID years. And I don't even know if they did then. Um, he said, well, it's only this year that it's on Wednesday. Next year it'll be on a Thursday and then Friday, you know, et cetera. Mm, that's not good enough for me because what you're talking about is there's four teams and of those four teams, unless one of them has a bye week and it's late in the year for a bye week, very late to get a bye week around Christmas. Um, unlikely that all four would have that. So, well, you could play the Thursday before you could play the Thursday before, and then but the Wednesday did, and then Monday night, even right. if you did, it looks like most teams could be looking at three games in 11 days. And that happened to the Bucks one time, mm-hmm. and it is not it is not the recipe for anything. Now they weren't very good. John Gruden coached them, and they played a Thanksgiving game, um, you know, in Dallas, and I think they also may have played on a Monday night. Maybe it was three games in twelve days, but regardless, it was way too much football in, in too few a days, and there, and it's just it's the cumulative effect. It's not even. You know, can you make it to the game? Is the quality of play and all that? Um, there's just no time to recover the bodies, you know. And so that means you can't practice because you can't have guys running out there for three days before they play again. I just think it's a bad idea. And I think I think Rich is right. I think that there is, you know, everybody loves ice cream, but if you eat it at every single meal, you're going to get tired of ice cream. I, I just think that they need to be very, you know, careful uh, about – you know, how much football that they ask their fans to try to follow. But, you know, what's more important than that is the amount of dollars they got coming in, you know, from the streaming services. Now, I don't know this, but I'm guessing one of those Christmas games, maybe both, will be streamed. I think you they're know? putting the bidding up and starting at like $50 million a game. 
50 million a game. Yeah, not hard not hard to understand it. And that's the thing about the players, you know, you can't Yeah, they get really, half. You can't do anything about the players association without their approval. And when you tell the players, yeah, we're going to make an extra 50 million, you're getting 48% of that. And then you divide that by the number of players in the league, 1700, all of a sudden these guys are making several hundred thousand dollars more. That's hard money to just say, you know, no, we're good. Um, nobody's going to do that. Uh, so I hate it. I know I hate it for me, but, you know, no one's going to cry cry a river for me. I've worked Christmases before. I've worked Christmas Eves before. I miss Christmas. Like, that's, you know, Thanksgiving. That's just part of the deal. But I'm hoping that they don't have one of those games. I mean, I don't think anybody likes to play on a holiday, much less during the middle of the week. It's bad enough for your one Thursday night. Now, the thing about Thursday night, the ugly truth about that is, Players like it in this sense that they get the time off after the game, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, mm-hmm. sometimes Tuesday. And so it's like a mini bye week. But more more importantly, for them, they don't practice. You know, the, yep. most most teams play on Sunday. Just walkthroughs. And it's just walkthrough. And they love that. I mean, their bodies are still sore when they have to get out there on Thursday night. It's not quite recovered. That would be your second day of practice normally. But you know what takes it out of you during the year is the grind of you know, every day we're going out there and doing our walkthrough. Then we're going to do our full full practice, you know, with, what is it, 14 in pads or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, but they, they players love it, you know. And they don't like, you know, while they're doing it, they don't necessarily embrace it. And I don't. I think the quality of play isn't as good because I don't think the preparations is good. I mean, that's usually what it comes down to the teams that prepare better. And how can you get looks against another team's defense if you're not going full speed in practice? So I, I think there's that element to it. But they do like obviously the extra money they get from it, and then the fact that you know it's kind of like it's like the last week of school, right? You you got to go. But everybody's playing board games or cards or something. It's like, who doesn't like parties the last week of school? It's kind of stupid you're there, but you get to be there and not do anything. So that's that's really what I found is most players, they're okay with one Thursday night game. Um, in fact, sometimes they're better than okay because it, it does. It gives them a little bit of, of a breather on the backside. All right, Jeffrey asked, why is Jason Light and company not signing an end pass rusher to go with Yaya? JTS has not shown enough. I was hoping we would trade for Reddick, especially how cheap the asking was. 2026 fourth round, I believe. Please shed some light on this. I I don't know. I mean, Reddick is a is a good example. Um, I don't know what their evaluation of him is. And trust me, uh nobody is closer to Howie Roseman than Jason Light. He introduced him to his wife, Blair. And those two guys are thick as thieves. Now, ironically, they competed against each other. How we beat them during the regular season last year, and Jason got them when it mattered in the playoffs. I don't understand uh, the whole Reddick thing, and maybe he knows more about him, you know, than we do. Again, because he knows the guy in Philly. They absolutely like if you were just going to list, you know, wish list one hundred and one, right, Buccaneers. You could get an all-pro player at these positions or maybe one all-pro player at, all, at, at a position. What position would you choose? I would say on this team, edge rusher. Because here's the reality. Um, yes, Yaya Diaby showed promise, especially towards the end of the year, that he might be that guy, okay? Might be. Now, Joe Tron Schoenk is in his final season. And when I talked to Todd Bowles, you know, at the NFL meetings, he described Joe Tryon as a chess piece. Uh, I don't know that I want my edge rusher described as a chess piece. And what he meant by that is we're going to move him around. He's better when he moves around. He can rush inside. He can play outside. He can drop in coverage. It's nice when you want to fool people and dial up some exotic stuff. But what I need is what Shaq Barrett gave them when he came here the first year, and that's a guy that's going to come off the edge on every single play and wreak havoc in the backfield and get 19 and a half sacks. I don't know. I mean, was Shaq the last guy to get 10? I think he was. And so, 
you know, they, they, you know, it's one thing they, they've gotten a number of sacks, like just in terms of sheer numbers, haven't dropped that dramatically 45, 44, whatever it is. But what they really need is to do it without blitzing. You know, so many of their sacks come from double A gap blitzes from linebackers, uh, you know, a lot from Antoine Winfield. What do you have, six last year? I mean, damn near led the team. So those are great because those are things that you've gone in and you scouted and you said, you know what, on this situation, if we get them in this look, you know, uh, we think this guy can win, we're going we're gonna to bring you the house. But they don't always get there. And when they don't, you're exposing something on the back end. But what you really want to do is have a front four or a front seven that can get pressure on every play, whether you blitz or not. And, you know, whether you get them on the ground is a sack, which is nice, but you got to affect the quarterback and then play coverage behind it. That's what you really want to do. And their front four does not get home enough for them to be elite as as a defense. They just don't. And that's why Todd Bowles has to do a lot of exotic stuff to kind of make up for that fact, you know? Um, when you're, when you're under tackle, like Vita Vea led your team in sacks with like six and a half one year. Great for Vita Vea. Outstanding job. Horrible for the team. You can't have it happen. You know, a guy that's double teamed all year inside, he's your sack leader. What do the other guys do? And that's why Shaq Barrett isn't here. You know, God bless him. Uh, he had to overcome a lot last year. I don't think he was in the best of shape. We'll see if he you know, re-engages in Miami this year. But they just didn't get it. You know, Anthony Nelson is a highly productive guy for the number of sacks he plays. But I liken that to, you know, a lot of guys that the Rays would have that Joe Madden or Kevin Cash would only hit against left-handers, you know, or a left-hander that can only, you know, hit righties. Um, And you're like, why didn't this guy play every day? Well, because they're putting him in the best situations to wear out the pitcher he can handle. And – and so I I think, you know, they they definitely it, it is an oversight, but I don't know outside of Reddick. It, look, elite pass rushers don't make it to free agency usually. You're either gonna give up a King's ransom and draft picks, and maybe Reddick didn't go for that. Um, or you have to draft them. And like I said, they're picking kind of low to get that elite edge rusher. Um We'll see if the quarterbacks push players down to them, which could happen. There could be as many four, five, some say maybe six go in the first round, quarterbacks that is. So maybe they're they're in range where they could move up or uh, take one where they're at. But I I would list that need as their biggest need because they simply don't have guys, pure outside linebackers, that are going to get you 10 sacks. You know, outside of maybe Diaby which is promising, but let's see if he does it. Uh, it's only his second year. You know, understand, too, that, you know, it was a long season for him. He got up to kind of a slow start. I think he wore down, and then he picked it up at the end. But other teams now have tape on him, and they're going to make adjustments, too. You're not going to surprise anybody with your strength or your speed or your moves. So you got to come up with a whole new toolbox this year. So I, I'm not ready to give the sack crown to anybody on that team. I, I think it's a glaring weakness. And I think they have to address it. And, and the only reason I, could, I think they haven't addressed it yet is they haven't found a guy for the value, you know, of what a team was asking for. Or maybe in the case of Reddick, while it looks like decent value, they knew something that we don't know. I, I can't speak for that. All right, we'll switch to Rays here before we wrap up. Craig asks, I know it's early, but could the Rays be loading up for 2025 with all the guys on IL or suspended list? Did, did they deal Tyler Glass now too early? If stadium for some reason is not approved, does a fire sale happen like you see in Oakland? You can answer anyone you want. I think they're loading up for the new stadium is what I think. I, I think that's that's the year that's going to be important, which would be what, 2027, 28? 28. Yeah, at this point it would be 28. Um, look, their payroll's as high as it's ever been, approaching $100 million. Some of that is just the cost of business now. Mm-hmm. Everything has gone up, including – player payroll um but you know i don't think they're going to go out and dump huge free agent money until they know what where their revenue is coming from and that revenue has to come from 
their development bill, deal with the city of St. Pete and, and what is possible in terms of revenue streams in the new ballpark. I mean, that's really what has to happen. Now, the last time I heard Stuart Sternberg, I guess it was going back to Fan Fest, he didn't sound as optimistic. He said, well, you know, it's not going as fast as we'd like. We definitely got some hurdles. You don't want to assume anything. I wish it was faster, you know, that sort of stuff. It seemed a little pessimistic, quite frankly. When he last spoke on opening day, I thought the tone had changed greatly. Like, no, this is going to happen. We're going to have the votes. You know, we're going to be able to do this. So I hope that's that's the way it's going. Um, but to me, if I own the Rays, whether I'm going to play here in 2028 or take a team somewhere else, and and you don't, like, look, every year you have a chance, right? You just got to make it to the postseason and then see what happens. I don't think a lot of people thought the Texas Rangers were the best team in baseball last year, but they won the World Series. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I, I think that you want to stay competitive. Um, they absolutely, you know, think they have a chance in the AL East, certainly a wild card. They want, they're on the streak of playoffs, so they know how to do it. They know they know how to get it done, and they get it done with 55 or 60 players, not just 25 like everybody else. So they're going to go for it, but... I think every move they make is for this year and the future. You know, t- trading Tyler Glass now. And the reason they traded him is because he was owed $25 million this year, which would be more than a quarter of your payroll if you kept him. At the current payroll. But they got Ryan Pepio, who they're hoping will be a starter for the next four or five years for them. And then figure it out from there, whether you trade him for somebody else or sign him long term. That by that point, you're in a new stadium. Like every deal is for this year and for the future. Like they're constantly looking at, and part of it is who do we have coming up in the minors? Okay, Junior Caminero, where are we going to put him by next year? Because by next year, he's going to be in the bigs. Yeah, that's true. You know, and, and and they look at that pipeline too. I mean, they traded Willie Adamas to make room for Wander Franco. Like it, it's all a it's to go back to Todd Bowles is they got a bunch of chess pieces, and injuries and things happen, and Wander Franco's deal happens, and now you have to adjust. But they're never looking at just a we're loading up for this year and going for it and forget next year. Like that's not the way they do business. It never has been. It's always every move can lead to more moves that it leads to the future. It, it's not – they don't make a move just to make a move. Like there's thought of it like this guy's going to be here and maybe we trade him next season or what. I mean, they re-signed Tyler Glass now. After he was hurt, they signed him to keep the $6 million salary for last year and then twenty five this year so that they didn't have to trade him in the middle of last season because they were going to lose him as a free agent. Like that deal was done knowing they were going to trade him in the offseason because there was no way they were keeping a $25 million pitcher. But okay, there's no way they were because they don't have a new stadium, mm-hmm. because they don't have that kind of revenue. Yeah. Well, and Wander I Franco's think all that contract. Decision, look at Wander Franco's changes, contract. It's all, all backloaded. Changes, though. Yeah, it's all backloaded. Now, yeah. three years from now, different story. Right. And maybe it's Ryan Pepio you're giving that deal to, or Randy Arazarena, or Junior Caminero. Or to Josh Lowe. You know, well, and we'll I think s- you're right in that, look, the Rays want to win every year. Mm-hmm. They want to get into the postseason every year. And at some point, the theory is that if we get there every year, one time we're going to make it back to the World Series and maybe win it. And that's a good theory because mm-hmm. we just saw a Texas team that I don't think many people would have picked to win at all. Nope. And so, fact, the, the way they ended the season and lost the division crown, it had to be a wild card. They had to be a wild card and fly from Seattle, and still yeah. in two games, the Rays played maybe their two games, worst two games of the year, and so Texas advances. But even then, they, they had to go lost on the road. a road game in the playoffs. Yeah, which is incredible. It was unbelievable, and I, you know, that's the great thing about baseball is, is that you know the, there are two different seasons. You just got to get to the postseason, and then you take your chances. A little like the Lightning as well, but you know, and and people ask us all the time, well, would you rather win a World Series once every ten years? Or go to the playoffs and never win one. But that, that you know, is it guaranteed I'm going to win the World Series every ten years? I'll take. I, mean, that. I don't want to. I don't want to be the Mets. It's only you know, one of, like, there's only one of thirty that get to, rate, to win the World Series. You're going to win it every ten years. I'll take yeah. that every time. I don't want to be the Red Sox and just you know bottom out after I win one. 
You know, that's if you could guarantee me it, sure. But it isn't guaranteed. Mm -hmm. And so all you can do is all you can do. Try to put a team on on the field that can win and get into the postseason. And then, you know, even if you're a wild card, you still you still got a chance, just like everybody else. It may not be as good a chance. But the thing about baseball is I don't know how big the home field advantage is in baseball. I know in hockey it's not that big. Well, or the last at bat is always key, but yeah, you know, last at bat in game seven is preferred. Game seven, yeah, sure. No, I I agree with that. You'd rather have it than not, mm-hmm. but it's not going to stop anybody. No. So no, their way has been tested, tried, criticized, rung through the washing machine, and it always comes out the same way. They know what they're doing. Mm-hmm. You know, I think you have to trust them now. Do I think this is their is, – is this team better than last year? No. Not as it currently as constructed. Well, I'll just think your start your top three starters going into last season were Glasnow, McClanahan, and Eflin. Yeah, I mean, these guys don't even – I mean, other than Eflin. This year is still Eflin, pitching. Savali, and Littell. Yeah, and Eflin's your ace. Mm-hmm. I like them better as your third starter. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't think Savali – my personal opinion is I don't think Savali is going to win you 15 games, 10 games. I don't know. I could be wrong. I want him at the bottom of my rotation. But you don't have springs. You don't have, you know, some of these guys. And so, you know, they got they got to play the hand that they have. But I wouldn't, you know, the other thing you got to count on too, and it's one time through the through the rotation. But what adjustments now, you know, will will you know Snyder make mm-hmm. between starts in the bullpen? Sometimes it's not much. Sometimes it's just a tweak here, a tweak there, you know. And he has every time these get on the guys get on the mound, he has an understanding of how do I get this guy back to neutral? You know, if things mm-hmm. start to go awry, what do I know about him that I, t- I got to remind him of, or tell him what to do? It's simple stuff. It's mechanical stuff. It, it sometimes is is a very minor correction, but yep. it happens. And I think he's still. And you know, some of it could be in their head, too. I mean, they're starting with two of the thickest lineups in baseball. And now you're going to go to some weaker lineups. Right. You know, so pitchers can get out of well, their Pe- own head. Pepio admitted he was in his head. He said, the first inning yeah. went, is sped up on me. Yeah. And I think that'll happen when you walk your first two batters you face as a starter. And that's what happens with young players. Yeah. That's going to happen. We've seen yeah. it happen with – go through the lineup of players that – the game sped up or I mean Wander Franco struggled some when he came up. Yeah, he did. You know, I mean that's what the, Willie Adamas struggled a lot when he was up. Like it's what happens. Well, the Taj first Bradley thing, last year did. And we'll see how he comes back this year once he's healthy. There's a lot more information in minor league baseball that transfers to major league baseball. Mm-hmm. Um but you still the first time through the big leagues, mm-hmm. maybe a series or two you may get a lot of breaking balls or a lot of fastballs or a lot of sliders, whatever that is. And if you're wearing it out, you won't see one for three weeks. Yep. I promise you won't happen in college to me. I, I couldn't believe the advanced scouting they had at, at Arkansas State's opponents. Like, I got off to a great start. Next, I don't think I saw a fastball for a month and a half. Like, they do not throw you what you can hit. <laughs> it's just not going to happen. And so then you have to make the adjustment, right? Mm-hmm. And that's why they call these guys major leaguers because they're capable of making the adjustments. Um, and the same is true on the mound. You know, they, these guys are, are still trying to figure out what they are. And yet once the other team gets the book on them and lays off certain pitches and, you know, then they got to come back and throw them for strikes and make the adjustment. But um, there's a whole lot that goes on between the pipes, man, between your ears and – that's really what the game boils down to, you know, and especially like at the major league level. Like I, I marvel because I tried to play the game, but I marvel at how good these guys are. Like, and and the, just the mental grind, mm-hmm. the physical the physical grind is one thing. I mean, I love playing. I'd have, I'd have played every day, especially if you paid me. You probably wouldn't have had to, but but physically, it's it's a grind. But mentally, oh boy, <laughs> I mean, yeah. 
It's a huge grind. Well, it's the ultimate sport, too, of, okay, I get in that bat, and it's going to be 30 to 40 minutes before I get another one. That's right. Yeah. Like, it, there's that, but, like, you're playing basketball. Okay, I missed a shot. I did the, yeah, but you're I gotta, going up I and down the court. 15 from, more, yeah. You know, and, and, and hockey, you're up and down the ice. And yeah. Baseball is the ultimate waiting around sport. It is. And it's a failure sport. Mm-hmm. And there's not many failure sports. You know, if you failed that much at hockey, if you failed that much, if a goaltender failed that much, he wouldn't play another game. You know, um, and, and, and in baseball, if you fail seven out of 10 times, they call you an all star. You know, you have to be comfortable with that. And it sounds, it sounds simple to do like, well, you hit that ball on the screws. It just was right at a guy. No, it messes with your head. Because mm-hmm. when you step up there the next time, you're 0 for 2. And then you're 0 for 3. And then maybe you do strike out. Now you're 0 for 4. Now you're carrying that into the next day, hoping you don't go 0 for 8. Like, it is a men- it, it, you have to reprogram your mind. And to play at that elite level, you know, Joe Madden used to say, like, when the guys first get up there, they think they can play in the majors. And we know they can, but they think they can. But there has to come a point where they know they can, where they know they belong, you know. And that's a process. That's not an overnight deal, mm-hmm. you know. And so, you know, you, and, and I'm sure the same is true with hockey. We've seen guys go up and down in mm-hmm. the NHL. But you have to believe in yourself and know how to get yourself programmed for that daily grind, you know, and mm-hmm. – what your role is and whether you can do it coming off the bench three times a week or twice a week instead of playing every day. Like there, there's all kinds of adjustments. And I'm telling you, the, the game is so hard that I, I don't, I'm, I find it hard to criticize anybody um, because I, I kind of know. And, and what the Rays do, the amount of confidence that they instill, the amount of information they give their players, you know, the situations they're able to put them in to make them successful who wouldn't want to play here? Who wouldn't want to go somewhere where they're able to tell you, if you do this, it's proven this is going to be successful for you. Mm-hmm. Like that's that's the whole key, you know. So give them a little time. Uh, it looks gloomy right now, and it, and the reason it does is because it was no secret their starting pitching is the issue, right? And then you go one time through the rotation, and you're like, yeah, the starting pitching is the issue, um, but. I don't think you're going to see 25 or 26 walks in a series mm-hmm. very often. You know, like I think they'll get a handle on that at some point. Or they're going to have to, but I don't know. I mean, look, the revenues for this team will change that team. They'll be able to keep the Tyler Glass now. They'll be able to, uh, you know, compete for a free agent, whether it's Juan Soto or not. I don't know, but they'll they'll be in the mix for some of that stuff. But really. They're already at $100 million, which we never thought was possible with this team. Mm-hmm. And so they're expecting to win. But in a perfect world, I'm going to the World Series when that stadium opens, man. <laughs> I, want, I want to have a hell of a team so I can fill that yard every single night and they can all go to those restaurants and things that we're developing around it. That's what I want if I'm the Rays. But first, got to get the deal. All right, we'll end on this one. Dave has a wacky idea, he says. Wacky. Why don't the Rays cut bait with Juan DeFranco? We all know where this is heading. And reallocate that money to re-signing Arena or signing Bo Bichette, who's a local product, of course. He has all the tools and is a UFA in 2026. Well, first, I guess of, all, the- first of all, you can't cut Wander or no, his full he- contract is guaranteed. Right. Because as of right now... There's nothing that in the CBA that you could cut him and, and not have to pay the contract, which is 220 some million, whatever, throughout the course of it. It's all backloaded. Right now, the money's cheap. So you have to let the process go. I mean, he's on the administrative list right now. He's being paid, but it was negotiated between MLB and the Players Association to do that through June 1st because he's under contract. And as of now, Guilt or innocence haven't been determined. Correct. Now, let me ask you this, because I don't know, and I I should because I work for the newspaper that covers this. What happens if he's found guilty? Well, then then it's a... Is he in violation of a morals clause of some kind? Potentially, and that it, it could be a fight between the Players Association and baseball, depending on what he's guilty of exactly. Yeah. And it's also guilty in the Dominican Republic, not United States. 
So I, I uh, to be honest, I don't know those answers. Yeah. I just know that until something happens or he's found guilty or whatever that part is, the Rays are kind of stuck. Yeah. Now, the money they're paying him isn't that expensive. The, the contract, like I said, is all backloaded. It's backloaded, yeah. For the new stadium. But if you were to cut him today, now it's possible someone could pick him up on waivers if you cut him. But then they may be locked into that full contract. Right. You know, so at this point, you just kind of have to wait to see. And, you know, as right now, he's not guilty of anything. He could end up being innocent or not guilty. Or no charges. Or char- I mean, you know, who knows what's going to happen down there? That's what that's what we don't know, and you just have to let that process play out. And we think that process will take at least this season to, to resolve itself, right? I, right now, he's on the administrative list through June 1st, which means he's not taking up a roster spot in that. Yeah. Um, at that point, if nothing's determined, I mean, you're kind of at the mercy of the, the the authorities in the Dominican Republic. Process, yeah. But they could negotiate that longer. It's possible the Players Association at that point could say, no, he's not guilty. He hasn't been charged with anything. He needs to – you need – you know, he's on a roster. You have to play him. And then at that point, baseball has to – you know, that's where it's, it, it, it's negotiation in that. Now, I don't know if the Players Association would push that hard. Right. If if everything's still going on like it is now. Because it's, it's not a good look for the Players Association to be pushing someone accused of that. You no, know, if, if if the process is still ongoing. In the meantime, though, I think they found a suitable shortstop to replace. I mean, as far as a guy you can run out there every day. Defensively. Yeah. You miss Wander's bat. Oh, totally. And when you, when he was out, you missed it last year. I mean, yeah. Taylor Walls is a good defensive replacement for Wander as well. Yeah, but he's not. Yeah, he's, he's not, not healthy Wander. right now. But, I mean, yeah. you know, the, the biggest problem is, is Wander brought the defense and the bat. Yeah. Yeah. And and this lineup is missing that big time. It, it missed yeah. it at the end of last season. And, and I think he protected a lot of guys, especially mm-hmm. Randy, mm-hmm. you know, um, others too, I'm sure. Well, um, you and I were talking off the air the other night. What bats do you fear in this lineup? I, 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 there's really two. Very few. There's I two. Mean, Yandy and well, Rosarina. Yandy Diaz is an MVP and he hit three thirty right. something and a Rosarina. He's, he's AL batting champion in Rosarina. And even though he leads off, I could maybe even pitch around Yandy a little bit. I mean, I don't want to give him a first inning walk every time, but you know, when he comes mm-hmm. up other times, I got options. Perhaps I mean, does Brendan Lau put fear in you? No. When he gets Only, hot, when he gets hot a little bit, yeah. But I mean, it's it right now. It's Yandy, then Brandon Lau. It should be Wander in that two hole. Yeah, you know. Well, that was the thing. You couldn't pitch around Yandy, anybody. Wander, Randy. One, yeah. two, three in an order. Yeah, who are you pitching around? If like, you pitch wow. around Yandy, if you pitch around Yandy, then Wander's up mm-hmm. with a man on. If you pitch around, you know, it 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 just didn't work. And and I think I think too. If Josh Lowe was active and on this team, you'd feel much better about what they're running out there every night, too. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the left-handed yep. bat, the guy that you know showed some power, mm-hmm. some consistency. Your but, hope is guys like Junior Caminero become those bats? Yeah, in the future absolutely. Too? Absolutely. I, I just don't know how, how like some of the guys, like Paredes, are they going to repeat what they did a year ago? I'm not sure. Those those could have been career years for but them. But Paredes isn't one of the – I mean, he's a good hitter. I, I'm not – you know, I mean, they're all good hitters. Like, well, he serv- gave you home runs. Yeah, they're serviceable hitters in the major leagues. But the guys yeah. that put fear in you. Right. Like that make your lineup thick. Right. You know, no, they don't have that. That's they what got they're, two that's hitters. What, with right. Wander Randy out, they're, they're missing that. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, you named them. Those are the two guys. And the other guys are a little too, too inconsistent. And, you know, it's great that – you know, Lowe ran into one for a grand slam, and, and because he did, they won the game. Mm-hmm. You know, he he can do that. I've seen him carry him for a month. Absolutely. I mean, he still hit 39 bombs one year. You can't fake that, but mm-hmm. way too inconsistent for me. And, yeah, it's it's and even then, once you get past the sixth spot, you know, it, it, there's a lot of outs before I get back to Yandi again. Mm-hmm. So... You know, you, you're going to have to really find a way to string those innings together. It's been tough, man. They, they're they not – I mean, just man for man, 
starting with the starting pitching, but then even going through the lineup, they're they're not nearly as good a team as they were a year ago. And a year ago, they won 99 games, so they were really good, Mm -hmm. right? The question is, are they good enough to make a wild card this year? Are they good enough to win 90, 88? You know, what would what will it take? And and I don't know the answer to that. I got my suspicions. I think it could take a slide this year. I really do. But I don't know. And that's the beauty of the Rays is they find a way. You know, they, they find a way to use all the guys in the minors and all the guys in the majors and make some trades during the season. And next thing you know, I mean, when remember, what was it too long ago? Jeffrey Springs came over as a sometime reliever. They flipped him to a starter, and then he started. He was lights out till they mm-hmm. got it hurt his arm. Yep. You know, so this is the sort of thing they do, and could do again during the, any course of the season that could change the whole, you know, complexion of your starting staff. So, you also got to hope if you think it's thin now, don't lose some of the guys you have now. Don't don't lose any of those top three guys. Yep. Because there there's no the cavalry is not is not coming. You know, you got to wait until the second half of the year. Now, second half of the year, you might get a couple guys back from Tommy John. Well, I mean, this season you're hoping that Taj Bradley is early May. Sure. And Shane Boz is maybe late May. And I think Taj and- Bradley, you know, there's an expectation he'll be much better, and he was good at times last year, but it's not mm-hmm. a guarantee. No, He's it's still not. a young pitcher. It's not, but you hope that – much like Pepio was nervous and, and yeah, like, second year, like, yeah. you know, we know that Josh Lowe, when he first came up different position, but struggled and everyone's, you know, they, they got rid of Austin Meadows essentially to put Josh Lowe in the lineup mm-hmm. and everyone went, this was an awful decision. This was, what are you yeah. thinking? And then he comes out the second year and look at him. Yeah. You it's know, different player that it take it, 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 the mental part of it. And it just takes time. And, and oh, by so, the way, Meadows has not been Meadows since he left. Him. No. But you, Taj Bradley, you hope that second year he's in a different mindset. He's, you know, he was also called up probably sooner than he was ready for. Yeah, he was. Like it was injuries is why he came up. It wasn't their plan to bring him up that soon. Yeah, I think Pepio is very similar in that aspect. Mm -hmm. Like he's kind of where Taj was last year. Probably a little too soon to have huge expectations for him, Mm -hmm. but you need him to you need him to fill the hole. Well, and part of that mental thing too is I was traded for Tyler Glass now. Like I'm supposed to replace him in the lineup. Yeah, you can't put that pressure on yourself, man. You know, it's like it, it, with, with the Lightning. A lot of fans get mad at Tanner Janot because of how much they gave up for Tanner Janot, and they don't right. think he's lived up to it. Well, first of all, the player didn't make the trade. Yeah, he didn't make the deal. Yeah, why are you blaming him? You know, the, the general manager is the one who said he's, you know, we think he's worth that much. But right. but the player carries those expectations with them a lot of times. And yeah, how do you car- compartmentalize that and, and not sit there and go, I have to be Tyler Glass now as I'm no. a rookie? They're placed on them. You just got to be the best mm-hmm. version of yourself. And yep. you got to hope that, you know, Kyle Snyder and those guys can get it out of you. But, look, I got lots of confidence in the Rays as an organization. It is a marathon. You know, they haven't even made it, you know, to the first mile post. Mm-hmm. And they play two of the best teams in baseball. Yeah. And and those, yeah, those are bona fide, you know, great teams that we would expect to be in contention in September. You just would. Um, and they have been – they have been lately. So one's a World Series champion. Let's see what they do when they get through this series, win or lose, and go to Colorado and the schedule turns in their favor. Mm-hmm. You know, do you beat up on some of the lesser teams? Well, if you do, you know, this could be one of those years like how far are they under 500 and how far can they get above 500? Like, you know, I think they're going to spend a lot of time in the middle, you know. And then, then we'll just have to see the second half of the season if they can get some separation when they get some help back. Mm-hmm. But in, interesting. I mean, it's a great. You know, it's a great thing about baseball is every single day, you kind of ride the roller coaster. But you know, the, the one thing I learned, it's not like football, where you want to see a roller coaster. It's the Shikra because, you know, every game is is seventeen games in the major leagues. Yep. You know, so it, it's it's just a different deal and. The thing about baseball, especially when you're around it and you cover it, is these guys can have the god awfulest day at the plate, at the park, on the mound, and they show up the next day, and it's it's as if nothing happened because it has to be that way Mm -hmm. because you can't do anything about it. You have a game today, you can't carry that over the next day. Yep, and and that's what's great about covering the sport is that like no one's in a 
grumpy mood per se because it's like no we gotta play today so well yeah no we didn't we kind of blew that series or you know i i went over five so you know but the great thing is maybe i'll go five for five today like your hope is in your next at bat your next appearance and guys really learn how to let it go and those those teams and those players that can do that are the ones that play a long time because again it is a failure sport and that's why i think kevin cash is so great that's why joe madden was so great if i had played for joe madden i'd have been a much better player because Joe Madden makes you focus on just the process, not the result, you know? And if you can do that in baseball, the results will, will be what they are. But if you can just take care of the daily process of it, you know, and not worry, you know, about what happens after that, that's the way to survive. And um, and he was great at that. So interesting questions, all of them. Uh, we still got more opportunities for mailbags throughout the week. You can always send them to us anytime, not just when we call for them. You can do that on Twitter at SportsDayTB. You can reach me on Twitter at NFL Stroud, or my email address is rstroud at tampabay.com. There's a rumor going around. Can't confirm just yet that maybe back and better than ever, Rick and Tom on this podcast. I have heard the rumor. Hilarity will ensue. I hope it happens. I'm going to see if he answers his phone. <laughs> let's just let's <laughs> leave it at that because he may not. I sent him a message the other day, and he's like, oh, somehow I missed this. Yeah, like 20 hours ago. New phone. Who dis? Yeah, who dis? Who dis? Exactly. That's what I'm waiting for one day. He'll be like, who dis, man? But, uh, yeah, we're, we hope to have him. And then, of course, anything that goes on uh, throughout the week with the Tampa Bay Lightning headed to Toronto, right? Is that their next? They'll play uh, tonight in Toronto. Yeah. That's and then a big tomorrow one. in Montreal. So it's a th- it's a big one, man. That's that's a team you have some playoff history with. That's a team that you could potentially still catch. Yep. Uh, if you, you lose this game them, tonight, you need more you than probably those can't four catch, points. Yeah. If you lose this game tonight, you probably can't catch third. You probably points, can't but. get there. Yeah. You're running out of game. But I don't and think course, the Lightning care about catching the. No, I think, I think at this point just they just want it. they want to clinch. Yep. What's their magic number now? Four. Seven. Seven. Okay. With eight games to play. Seven with eight games. So that, that could change in a hurry, mm-hmm. especially with a win. But here's the other thing I'd say. You know why you want to win? Because you want to win every time you play a team. But don't you want to put just a little bit of doubt in the, the Leafs' mind that, hey, we figured you out. We know how to match up with you. We know how to win a game against you, you know? Yeah, I think so there's some of that. They'll, they'll, the, they play again at the end, last game of the season here at Emily Arena, too. Yeah, but yeah. I, you want to be competitive is what I'm saying. Oh, like absolutely. You want to be able because if you get in the postseason, there's a chance you'll see them. Well, and, and, and you know, another subplot is Nikita Kucherov and Austin Matthews are both in the MVP hunt. They're both in a race, yeah. I mean, Austin Matthews now with 62 goals. It's a franchise record for the man. And what if you're the team that figures out, at least for these next two games, to contain him? Yeah. That would that would bode well for the postseason Absolutely. if you're the team that does that. Well, the Lightning did a pretty good job containing him in the playoffs last year. Oh, you're right. They actually did. Yeah. The Sorelli line did a great job against him. Yeah. So they're all important now, but uh, this one will be entertaining for sure. Yep. All right. Thanks for listening. Uh, we appreciate it. We're here each and every day, Monday through Friday. For Steve Verstick, I'm Rick Stroud of the Tampa Bay Times. Have a great day, everybody. 